Hello, 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 hello. And good afternoon, evening, night, whatever you want to call it. It's not afternoon though. Yeah, good, good, uh, good evening. And uh, good to be here today. Missed you guys last week. Um, hey, Sandra. Like I said, if you don't see an invitation or an event, I'm probably not gonna be able to go live. I don't always announce it, but I'm usually here every Tuesday unless you don't, if you don't see anything before the eight o'clock time. Uh, nine times out of ten, I'm not gonna be live. So uh, sometimes I don't know uh, things come up, and unfortunately, I just can't do it. But anyway, we're here tonight, and I'm excited about this topic and excited to share these things with you that may help you and through your adversity and your uh, whatever you're facing in your life now. Uh, you see, my topic is on <clears throat> nothing complicated against all odds. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys, uh, but as I said in my description, that have, have had odds against you and things where you face an impossible thing that you know you could have nothing, there's nothing you could do about the outcome. Uh, and the thing that you're facing seems so much bigger than you. Um, but the great thing about that is uh, we serve a God that's bigger than whatever you may face. And we're going to talk about that. Um, but, you know, when the odds are against you, it doesn't mean give up. It doesn't mean pack up your bags and go. Because many people that accomplish things in their life, if they had packed it up and left, there's so much we would have not been able to experience, so many things that we wouldn't have available to us. Um, but somebody said no matter if the odds were against them, they were going to keep pushing and keep doing it. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing that encourages me to say, you know, if, if one person can, can say I'm going to keep going in spite of the odds, that means I can do the same thing and I can get the same outcome. And so uh, the biggest things that you see, you know, if you, you know, I use sports all the time. There's nothing new. Uh, teams have odds of whether they're going to win the championship or not, or whether they're going to be in this position next year or whatever, whatever they're going to do. Uh, the bookies or the people, they put out the odds of whether this will be accomplished. And sometimes the odds are against people, but yet they still make it there. Uh, this year, that nobody expected the Lakers to go as far as they went. Nobody expected Miami to go as far as they went in the basketball. But they got there when the odds were against them. Why? Because they continued. What's up, Sylvester? They continued to, to work hard. They continued to make adjustments. And that's the biggest thing. You can change the odds with your adjustments. And, and often teams will go out and make trades. They'll They'll go out and do different things. They'll make additions to coaching staff. They'll do different things for their team to make adjustments to what? Improve their odds. Because you don't, you don't allow the odds to dictate you. But a lot of times the odds will dictate where you are. Because oftentimes people live in an environment where there's no truth and where everybody around them is, is delusional. And sometimes you need to be in an atmosphere where you just hear the truth. It doesn't matter who it comes from, uh, who said it, uh, where you know, but if it's truth, it's liberating, and it will let you know where you are. And that's what sometimes you don't live your life based upon social media and statistics. If we all lived our life based on statistics, many of us wouldn't have, wouldn't have made it. Uh, you know, even as you know, African American males, we're born with the odds against us, and there's nothing we're not we're not playing the victim. We're not doing these different things. But the the the, the statistics show that there's many things stacked against us before we even come out of our mother's womb. And even the Bible tells us that man is a few days and full of trouble, meaning meaning that the odds are against you when you enter into this fleshly world, unfortunately. But God says, I have an alternative plan for you. And so you, if you take on God's plan, the odds don't matter because God is bigger than the odds. God is bigger than, than, than what the bookies say. God is bigger than what people can say about you. Because who who ordered your steps in the first place? It was God who ordained your life in the beginning. Who caused you to be conceived? God. You know, and even after you were conceived, whether you were supposed to be conceived or not, he said, I'll bless you and I'll break you and I'll anoint you in your life. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. And I'm not saying God, God was in the midst of whatever, how you were conceived. Sometimes it wasn't godly. But because you were allowed to be born, there's still a purpose over your life. And, and 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 the devil can't counsel it, and and we have to believe that purpose of our life. But against all odds, against all odds, when 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 the numbers are stacked against you, when people tell you you can't do it, when people tell you that's impossible, 
And the Bible tells us that all things are possible with God. And uh, with man, things are, are impossible. Things You can't accomplish certain things in your own skin, in your own might. Uh, that's why the Bible also tells us it's not by power or might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's just, I've come to grips with, there's just some things I can't accomplish and I can't do within myself. And usually those are the things that God ordained me to do because God, God, everything that God calls us to is always bigger than us. It's always bigger than our resources. It's always bigger than our intellect. It's always bigger than, 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 than anything that we could ever have in our hands to make it happen. Because what did I do? That brings on a trust that we have to have for God to bring, bring his plan to life. And see, I'm not under pressure because I have to do my part. But the thing is, my part is always accomplished. Uh, uh, it's always um, able to be accomplished because, because God is never going to tell me to do anything I can't do. And so he's going to tell you the part that it's just like when we we tell our kids to do something or we tell people to do something. Usually we're going to tell them something that that they're well it's well within their capabilities to do. And we try not to take people outside of their capabilities because we want what people to be successful. We want people to, to accomplish the goal. We don't want to set people. Real leaders don't set up their people to lose. But real leaders set up their people to win. And I'm not saying. Uh, don't put pressure on them. Don't put no, because in the pressure that there is development. And so there's a balance in that thing though, but you never want to set up people around you to lose. You don't want to set your children up for disappointment. You don't want to tell them that they can sing when they can't sing. You don't want to tell them that they're good at sport, that they're not good at. You have to be honest with them because if not, you're setting them up for a loss. Uh, but but you got to understand that it's not always going to be easy. You might not be that great now, but if if you're, if you're called to it, God will give you, a, God will develop you and God will put the right people and the right pieces around you, to develop you to become what he called you to be in spite of all the odds that's against you, in spite of all the, the naysayers, in spite, of, in spite of all the haters, in spite of all the doubters. You know, Jesus had doubters. His own brother doubted him. And so, Jesus understands that the rejection and the and the doubt and the and the unbelief that people can have towards us and then sometimes the pain that that causes. Uh, but anyway, let me get into this tonight. And I want to take this from one of my favorite Bible characters, David. Had all kinds of odds stacked against him, and he was able to overcome a lot of those things because of his perseverance, because of uh, 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 of his trust in God. And so we're gonna go. We're gonna go from there and uh, talk about this for a moment. And it's gonna be. We're gonna com be coming from what is it? First Samuel, seventeenth chapter. The majority of this tonight. Uh, where I get these principles from, and 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 we're gonna turn to First John for a second. I probably just quote it. I won't go to it because I know you know this scripture. So we're gonna start reading. At chapter 17, verse 4. And it says, And the champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from God, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a, a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a six bear went before him. So when you look at the scripture, the odds were pretty much against David. Uh, uh, David, when David came into the scene, because you know it, this big giant Goliath, who, whom in our terminologies, when you look at the at the at the at the, at the dimensions and, and and all the numbers that they just gave us, it means that Goliath was over nine feet tall. He was a big guy. You know, I don't know if you guys can remember. I meant to download that and, and show you that tonight. I'm sure you've seen it before. The picture with Shaq and Kevin Hart uh, was the funniest picture ever because Kevin Hart's head was probably at Shaq's waist or even lower. And it was so hilarious, them standing next to each other taking a picture. Uh, I know many of you remember that picture a long time ago that was taken. Uh, but when I think about this Goliath and David thing, David was probably, and I, I can relate to his height because he's, he was around my height, 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, and um, he was a small guy. And and to think about going up against Goliath, whom was this huge giant of a guy who who not only was a giant, 
but he wasn't a gentle giant. He was awaiting to swallow David, David up and destroy him. He was a big, you know, a big monster. And when you talk about going up against those things, we have a choice to say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a duck, I'm a pack up my stuff or I'm going to tuck up and run. You know, I'm going to get out of this thing. And, and sometimes you got to know when to fold them, when to hold them. But but when God when God calls you to something, that's, quitting is not an option. Packing up and leaving is not an option. But going forward is, an, is, is, is the only option you have. And you you might have to go. You might you might be afraid, but do it scared. I always tell people, do it scared. If you're afraid, still do it because it's in your doing. It's in your action. The Bible tells us that uh, uh, those that are willing and obedient eat the good of the land. Meaning, you you're not going to eat the good of the land just by your willingness, but you have to be willing and obedient. And so, when you're obedient to God and you step up forth and do what He told you to do, then that that's that's when the, the the purpose of God comes forth. That's when the, the the promise of God is manifested because what you followed His plan. And because you know the thing we need to see on this, God is bigger. Let me put that up. God is bigger than anything you'll ever face, and that's in that chapter what I just read to you. Uh, and then in First John four four it says, "Greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world." What is it saying? There's something inside of you, no matter how small in stature you may be, no matter how fearful you may be, no matter how big what's in front of you may look. God says, "Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world." So your opponent, the thing that's coming against you, no matter how big that is, He said something inside of you, the thing that's inside of you, which is God Himself. And God's power is always going to be greater and outweighs what you look what you're looking at. So you don't have to be afraid. But God understands sometimes we, we have that human reaction that we're going to be afraid. If a big bear come with me right now, I love the Lord and I believe in his anointing. But I'm my, my first reaction in my flesh will be I'm scared. Because that's human. But that doesn't mean that 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 I still can't accomplish and go in the direction that God called me to go in. That doesn't mean every time I see something I'm afraid of, I make a detour and turn and make a right when God said keep straight. Just because of my circumstance, just because this is coming against me, just because I, I've lost some things along the way, just because uh, I'm disappointed along the way, just because I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a feel like I'm 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 lonely and isolated along the way. It doesn't mean that I don't keep going straight forward. Because it's, go, it's my going straight forward and keeping on the path that gives me my peace. Because when you love God, whenever you get out of his plan and, and when you get out of what God wants for your life, then there's no peace in your life. Because your heart desires in its core to connect with God and to do what God asks you to do. And, and, and your spirit knows. Your mind might deny it. Your, your, your intellect may deny it. But God, your spirit tells you that you're not lined up with God. Your spirit tells you that. No, God said this, not that. And sometimes we'll try to come up with options and, and, and alternatives. And God says, no, it's, it's, it's straightforward. I told you to go here. And so God, but God is bigger than anything you ever face. So you don't have to be afraid. You, you don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to walk in with, I don't know if it's going to happen. You don't have to walk full of anxiety. Because God has given you the power to do whatever he called you to do. And so as you look at this giant Goliath that the, that the children, uh, God's people were facing and everybody was afraid. David, this little guy, little shepherd boy, looked at this thing differently. It's all about your perspective. When the odds are against you, it's all about how you look at it. You can't say, oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have what they have. I don't have this. I don't have what blah, 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 blah. They have more than me. They're bigger than me. They're that. Never let that intimidate you. You know, when I played sports, I, I knew it was, it was many people, more people that were better than me that played against me that I, than were than, than I was better than. But at the same time, no one ever intimidated me because I knew what I had. If I utilized what I had, I, I had a chance. And so I didn't have to worry. I never allowed the, the enemy or the opponent to, to intimidate me because my outcome wasn't based on what they had, but it was based on what God has given me. And if I stick to what God's given me, if I stick to, to, to God's plan, if I stick to the resources he has given me, so many times we focus on what we don't have versus on what we do have. And sometimes we end up with nothing because instead of utilizing what we do have, we just sit there and, and complain. 
and we just sit there and say, I don't have this, I don't have this, instead of enjoying what I do have. So I can sit here and say, I don't have nothing to eat. I don't have nothing to eat and just complain and complain. Or I can eat what I have and get full and not be hungry. And some of us wonder why we're hungry because it's like you spent so much time worried about what wasn't on your plate that you didn't eat what was on your plate. And God says, I'm never going to leave you hungry. I'm never going to leave you uh, and, and lack because that's not the God I am. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. What does that mean? He always makes sure that I'm fed. He always makes sure that I'm full because that's the kind of shepherd he is. God, God, God's not the type of God that malnourishes his children, that, that doesn't feed his kids. He's not an infidel. He's a God that takes care of his children. And when the odds are stacked against you, believe me, God is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And you don't have to be afraid. So, so, so the first thing is you got to understand that God is bigger than that. When something comes to you, the first thing you got to keep telling yourself is, I don't care how bad this storm is. I don't care how bad this obstacle is. I don't care how bad I messed it up. I don't care how bad I messed it up. I might have messed it up. But God is bigger than even my own mistakes. God is bigger. It doesn't matter. He's bigger than that. And so when I know that, it gives me confidence. I don't take his grace for granted. But I understand that, man, grace and mercy is following me. Even when I mess it up, God will be there to pick me up. God will be there to help me. And he'll never leave me, nor forsake me. So let's keep reading. And in verse 8, it says, Then he stood and cried out, to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? This is the Philistine talk. Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And so the second question, you got you got when you when the odds are against you, you got to ask the question why. First Samuel 17, 8, what I just read, says that the Philistine asked the question why. But you got to ask yourself, you ask, you got to ask your own self that question. And what, what do I mean by why? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I going to, choosing to go forward? You know, and then you look in verse 29, I'm getting ahead of myself, but but but, but, but Paul, I mean, David said, is there not a cause? Do you have a cause in your life that'll cause you to walk past your fears, that'll walk past your insecurities, walk past the things that, that happened to you in your past and walk forth into a new place in your life or walk through some things that may be difficult to face? to fight some fights that you know sometimes when you decide to fight you gotta say is it is this fight worth it is there a cause is there you know why why would i what am i going to gain from fighting and sometimes you'll find out when you gauge the question why sometimes you find out it might not be worth it some fights are not worth it some you got to make sure and, and even as you as you age in life and your endurance and your your strength begins to diminish that you don't fight unnecessary fights because you not, you don't you you don't have energy to be wasting. You don't have uh you don't have uh you can't throw away your peace. That's too important to you at this at this phase in your life. You can't you can't you can't uh compromise things that that are are, are important to you. Fighting fights that that's not your fights or fighting fights that don't even matter. So you got to ask the question why? Why am I fighting for this the relationship? Why am I fighting for my children? Why am I fighting for this? And these things have to matter to you. They have to be become a high priority. Anything that that that, that you'll fight for, anything that you'll go forward for, anything that you'll fight through your fears for has to be valuable to you. And so you have to have you have to be pushed by your purpose and, and you got to be pushed by your passion for things versus being pushed by circumstances because some if you fight based upon circumstances when it doesn't look good then you'll stop fighting and when it looks good you'll start swinging and so you can't in this in this life you can't fight when you want to fight you can't you can't do things when you feel like doing you got to do it when it's necessary and when, and when you're driven by your by your emotions and driven by your your own intellect it will cause you to do things at the wrong moment or cause you to do things that's not necessary and you're giving away and wasting away your your mental energy, your emotional energy, your spiritual strength, all those things you're just giving out. And so that's what the enemy wants you to do because he wants you worn out. And he starts from wearing you out on the inside. You know, I know uh, when the enemy works on me, he does it. Hey, sis, how you doing? Um, good to see you tonight. And uh, what he does, he works. The biggest way he gets to me is works on my mind. 
because if I something if I believe in something, if I'm passionate about something, I'm going. He know I'm gonna keep going. But when he mentally attacks me, that's where my fatigue comes from. See, I don't, uh, you know, my, my body gets tired quicker than it used to get tired, but I can push through that thing. You know, but the thing is, when you're mentally fatigued, that's what wears me out. And so that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to mentally wear you out. So your mind is so very weak and then it transcends or translates into your physical body where you just don't feel like doing anything. And and that's a terrible place to be. That's why it gets people stuck in this depression and stuck into this, this these these moods where it just sucks all the energy and the strength out of you. And then we like, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. That's that's a that's a that's a, a tactic of the enemy so he can defeat you. So you gotta answer this question, why? You gotta say, man, why is this if is it worth is this fight worth it in this season of my life? It's something that you fought when you was 28. That you can't fight when you're 50 and 60 years old. God has called you to a new fight. He's called new people to, to that fight. Let them let 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 them fight that battle. So I continuously daily ask the Lord, what 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 battles do I need to be fighting? Because if I try to fight every battle, I'm not gonna make it long. Or I'm not gonna be on on I'm not gonna be on my purpose. I'm not gonna be able to do things intentionally or do the things that and be effective because guess what? God's not behind my plan. It's my own plan. And I'm and when I work my own plan, guess what? I'm 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 obligated to bring forth my own results. God's not obligated to bring results to your plan. He's only he only guarantees when you follow his plan. It's just like any product you buy. And they'll tell you, oh, it's a warranty on it, but if you don't if you do certain things, the warranty is voided. If you if you take these screws out, we know you've tampered with the product and we can't guarantee anything. We can't guarantee the product is, is going to work correctly because you did something that you weren't supposed to do. And so the warranty or the or the, or the, or the factory warranty is not going to be uh, honored. And so God only guarantees when you follow his plan because it's his warranty. He said, I, did, I ordered your steps. I, I ordained you, anointed you to do certain things. And when you get outside of those things, I'll still be with you. I'll cover you when I can. I'll do, I'll do what I can for you because I love you. But I'm not, it's not guaranteed that I can cover your foolishness. And then sometimes I have to not cover your foolishness because otherwise you'll stay in your foolishness if I continue to cover your foolishness. So I have to allow you to turn you over to yourself in order to show you your own ignorance and your own pride. And then I'll help you. Because God's that type of father, man. He's never going to not help you. But he will take you through a process and he will uh, give you tough love. And he will take you through a process that 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 will cause you to understand his ways and that his ways are not, he's not trying to be a dictator, but he's just trying to bless your life. He's just trying to mature you. He's just trying to get you ready for next. And so, so here we go. But answer the question why? Why am I still? Hey Lisa. Answer the question, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You know, people may be in ministry. Why why am I doing it? Is it is it worth the sacrifice? Is it worth what I'm doing? Am I doing what God told me to do? Or am I just doing, I'm just fulfilling the pipe dream? Am I doing it for my own emotion or my own satisfaction? It has to be a why, y'all. And that can't be always the what. You gotta know what you gotta know the what and the how and all those other questions. But that the why is an important question. Why do I do what I do? Why do I sacrifice what I sacrifice? Why do I? Why am I willing to pay the price for this, but I'm not willing to pay the price for that? And what's that? You know, one thing about it, you can't dictate what's valuable to people. One person, uh, uh, a, a certain thing may be worth a million dollars. To another person, it might not be worth two cents. That's just our, everybody's values are different. Everybody, what people value is up. It, it, only they can control that. And eventually that comes out. They can fake like this, something else, they care about something or they value something, but in their actions or in their expressions, it'll show what they value and they don't value. You know what I'm saying? Everybody always uh, responds or acts acts a certain way because sometimes it might seem like someone is not concerned. In their physical, uh, excuse me, their physical communication may communicate something else. It's just like kids. Sometimes you think kids not paying you any attention. But well, actually, they're listening harder than anybody else. And then one day, five years later, they regurgitate what you told them. 
you're like shocked because you never thought they even pay you, paid you any attention. Or later and they get adults, they tell you like, tell you things that you like, you had no clue that they, 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 uh, they uh, comprehended something the way that uh, in your actions and the way they did, they did. Because a lot of times people care and people, people care about things that they always express it emotionally or physically or verbally. Uh, so it doesn't always mean that someone doesn't care because they don't respond like you want them to respond. But oftentimes uh, it does come through your body language. It comes through through how you express yourself to people. You know, so we just got to know that God God is working. Like you said, sis, that's right. He's working on our behalf. And we just got to know why. Why am I in this race? Why am I still fighting? Why am I still holding on to the rope? Why haven't I given up? What's holding? You got to know what's, you got to find that thing that keeps you holding on to the rope. You know, whatever that is, whatever keeps you holding on, that's where your passion lies. That's where your purpose lies. That's that's where your strength lies. So you got to say why, because some of us are doing too much or some of us are doing things that may be good, but not godly because God didn't call you to do it in the season. And it's wearing you out. It's messing your health up. It's messing your mental space up. It's messing you up emotionally. It's 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 causing you to have spiritual issues, and many things going on in your life because of it. And so, we 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 gotta have that. We gotta answer that question. Why? I'm gonna get off of that one because I can stay there all day. Because me, I I, I dictate my life off passion. If I, you know, sometimes if it don't mean nothing to me, it's hard for me to just go through the motions. It's hard for me to just do things just to be doing it or doing things just because it looks good or it sounds good. And, and, you know, I have to do things based upon what's in my heart. I have to do things based upon what I feel passionate about. What, 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 you know, sometimes, yeah, we have to do, we have to, uh, we have to have our list and function and do the responsibility that we have and just do things regardless of how we feel. But at the end of the day, we have to be motivated. By, by our godly passions and the things that God put in us to do in our lives. And we just can't go through the motions. We can't live life going through the motions. Life can't be just a list of tasks. Life has to be provoked by compassion. That's what the Bible says. Jesus was moved by compassion. And he went about healing all this, this healing the sick and, and, and delivering uh, uh, delivering the captives and doing all the different things. And, and I think it's Acts, Acts 10, 38. Because he was filled with compassion. The Bible always said he was moved by compassion. It's like, man, he's tired or he's hungry, but it was the compassion in his heart that caused him to move and do the things that he did. Because Jesus was a compassionate, compassionate man. And he had passion for what he did. He had passion for the people he served. And he and genuinely loved the people that he served. And he loved people in general. And so this is this is what he did. Okay, let's keep reading. My third thing is what's really on the line. First Samuel 17, 9 through 10. It tells us. Nine and ten. Let me get to the right scripture. If he, he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be, be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So basically it's saying what's on the line, meaning, okay, you're gonna be you're gonna have to serve us. If you lose, and if you win, we're gonna have to serve you. Otherwise, whoever wins this, the lordship was on the line, or the or or or, or whoever's gonna be in charge and have authority. It was power and authority that was on the line. So when you're choosing the why, and you're choosing why you're fighting, you gotta say, man, what's really on the line? What's what's really on the line? You know, not only why am I fighting, but what 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 what's at hand? Is the destiny of the next generation at hand based upon what I need to be doing? And sometimes when you know what's on the line, it'll cause you to get some get up and go about yourself because it's like, man, it's a lot on the line. I know it's a lot on the line when I think about the biggest thing you probably think about is your children, the next generation. Or if I don't do this, if I don't break the curse, then what's on the line? My my children are going to have to fight these devils. My children got to deal with certain things if I don't break the curse. So it's a lot on the line. So that kept me fighting, trying to break as many generational curses off of my life, trying to break these bad habits off of my life, because I knew that it was going to reduplicate itself in, my, in the lives of my children. There was a lot on the line. Think about in your life the things that you do. If you don't do them, what's on the line? 
what, 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 you know, when the odds are against you, what will provoke you is knowing what's on the line. You know, what's at hand? If it don't matter to you or you don't know that something's on the line, it's easy for you to quit. It's easy for you to just say, give up the ghost. But when you know that that's a cause, that there's something at hand that, that, that's important. Somebody's destiny is, is on the line. Some, somebody, somebody's physical life is literally on the line. Based upon what I've called you to do. You know, God's going to watch over people. He's not going to necessarily always leave, our, leave the destiny of life of somebody else in your hands. Because ultimately, God will bypass you and his grace and mercy will be sufficient and, and take over with, where, where you were disobedient. And I believe that. I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe, I believe, yeah, uh, people's lives could turn out a lot different if we do God's will and that, that God has intertwined our lives into the lives of other people. But at the same, same time, at the end of the day, it's our obedience. I mean, it, it's the obedience of our individual lives that dictate where our lives go. That makes sense. It means like, okay, there's some people I probably should have witnessed to and told about Christ, but I didn't do it. I don't believe God allowed those people to go to hell just because of my one disobedience. I believe there's always a ram in the bush. I, I believe if I don't show up, he'll speak to somebody else. I believe he'll do it. That's all I'm trying to say is that what, what you won't do, he'll do it through somebody else. But at the same time, you need to live up under that pressure knowing that when you're not obedient, that there are some things that God left on your hands, the blood that he put on your hand, and he's looking for your obedience. And your obedience means a lot to the lives of other people. And so you got to give a yes. And that's why it takes uh, uh, being in ministry or being a Christian takes a lot of unselfishness because the things that you have to give up in order to gain, you have to give up some stuff. And you got to be willing to lose some things to, to be able to gain some things in this Christian life. But what's really on the line? In this one, it was lordship. It was it was the ability to say, and whether to be a servant and have and have to serve and be under the authority of these people, I can be an authority. You know, I won't have to live as a slave. I want to live as a as a as a as a maid servant. So this was the thing that was on the line. And, and so the next thing, don't respond in fear, though. Starting at, at verse 11. When the Philistines said all these things to them, verse 11 said, when Saul and all the Israel, all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And so the enemy will say things and he'll talk and he'll he'll throw things in your face to make you afraid. You're never going to do this. I, you know you don't have no degree. You know you don't have this. You know you don't have that. You know, you, And he says those things in your head and it causes you to be dismayed or discouraged and, and full of fear. And that's what he wants you to become, fearful. He wants you to become uh, 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 dismayed because he wants to zap all of your passion away. He wants to take all of your confidence away. He wants to take all of your, you know, all, all the things that, that, that make you who you are. He wants to zap it out of you. That's his goal. So he says, when they heard all those things, they allowed it, they allowed it to dismay them, it allowed them to make them fearful. But as I said, in verse 29, in verse 29, let me go back. I am going to be in verse 29, but I mean, let me get this. Verse 29, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? He, David went back to the why. He said, no, it doesn't matter what, what, the, what the uncircumcised Philistine says. It doesn't matter what people say against me. It doesn't matter about the odds that are against me that they printed in the newspaper. Uh, the things that people told me that, that I wouldn't be able to overcome. It doesn't matter about all those things. He said, is there not a cause? Is there something inside of you that's bigger than you? Is there something inside of you that God has placed inside of you that's bigger than, than men, men's opinions? Is there something inside of you that, 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 that's bigger than your own desires? But, but, begins to, but, but it's like it's a godly desire. It's something bigger. It's something in you that's learn, yearning. You don't even know why you want it. You don't even know why it bothers you. You don't even know why it wakes you up in the middle of the night. But those are passions that God has given you. Those are things that God has put in you that he just made you that way. Or passions that you develop because of the route in life that he's taken you. And, you, and you're acquainted with some certain things in your life that other people are not. You know, the Bible tells us that that Jesus and, and Isaiah, 
It says Jesus was acquainted with grief, meaning that he had a relationship with certain things, which made him understand. That's why he understands our grief. That's why he understands the pain that we go through when we're rejected, when we're uh, uh, hurt and uh, heartbroken and all the things that, that life can throw at you. It was nothing. Jesus felt those same things. They say he was acquainted with grief, I meaning he had a relationship with grief. He understood uh, sad times and lonely times and misunderstood times and all these different things that we go through in life, these seasons of life. Jesus understood it. But you can't allow those things to cause you to respond in fear. You can't allow those things to make you not respond to the call of God, to the thing that God has called you to do, just simply because of an event in your life that happened in the past. Is there not a cause? Is there not a why? Is it not something bigger in your life that just, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Is your relationship with God just built off of, I don't want to go to hell? Is it just about the ticket or is it about the journey that God has called you on? See, salvation is not just about a ticket. It's about the journey along the way. And that's what it makes the difference. They always tell you, when you look at your life, you look at the year you were born and there's a dash between it. And then there's a, there's a start point and an end point. And many people tell us all the time that it, it's the dash in, the, in, in between that matters. It's what you do in between those two numbers that matters. And, and we got to take every day in between the, 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 the dash moments. And we got to take those moments and, and, and make the best of those moments. Not spend those days complaining, not spend those days procrastinating, excuse me, not spend those days uh, complaining, uh, excuse me, but spend those days praising God and obeying God because it's the dash that matters. Everybody has a starting point and everybody has an ending point. That's why life is bigger than us because all of us go, all of us go be born and we go all die. And, and, and when you die, life don't stop. I've been living for, 50 years, and many people have died, many people have gone, but life hadn't stopped. Matter of fact, the day the storm, the, the day that they, they leave this world, life still kept going on and on and on. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're, your mortgage was due on Friday and you happen to lose, you lose a loved one on that Friday, it doesn't mean that your bill not due. It doesn't mean that life doesn't go on because no matter how bad life gets, when you wake up in the morning, you got to live this life. You got to deal with this life. Whatever this life deals with, uh, uh, throws at you, you got to be ready to deal with it. And it doesn't matter what ha what's happening in your life. It doesn't exempt you from having to deal with what's in front of you. And unfortunately, God gives us the strength to do that. He didn't tell us to do this on our own. So we're going to always, a lot of times, have the odds stacked against us. And, and, and what happens is the, is, is the devil wants us to magnify the devil, magnify our problems. That's why David so much said in, 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 in the Psalms, magnify the Lord with me. Why did he say that? Not just to get us to sing songs with him. Not just to get us to jump up and shout. That's what, not what he was talking about. Magnify means to enlarge. It means to make something bigger in that moment. And so when you magnify the Lord, it doesn't mean the Lord isn't big already. But in your eyes, sometimes the Lord looks small. And if you begin to magnify him, he'll show you his greatness. He'll show you how large and how big he is. And not only that, he'll surpass not only how big and how large he is, but he'll show you how big and large he is in you. Because sometimes there, there's a discrepancy of how we believe in the name of Jesus. We believe in the name of God. And we believe in how big God is. But when, it, when we relate it to us, and how big he is, and his, his image changes. All of a sudden, God looks small. And so that same big God that you believe in other people and around other people, that same big God lives in you. And that's what you got to believe. See, there's a difference in believing God is God is who he is, but is it, you know, but believing that he's that for you. It's, it's good to know that God is a loving God, but it's a different thing in believing God loves you. And so you got to make that thing personal. And you got to know you can't respond in fear because the Lord is my shepherd. David was sure, assured of who God was in his life. He was assured of who God was inside of him. And that's why he was able to walk up to a nine foot giant and say, you know, this ain't nothing for my God. Let's keep it moving. But don't respond in fear.
do not respond in fear. And it doesn't mean you won't feel scared. It doesn't mean you won't feel at uh, feel a little nervous. Your nerves won't get a little bit, but it means that you're not going to respond by by re retreating. It doesn't mean that, that you're going to turn around and stop what God told you to do simply because of what's in front of you. Now, if you turn around, make sure God told you to turn around because God is so wise. He will give you a detour. Sometimes it's easier or better not to fight what's in front of you rather than God says, I have a detour for you on this. Sometimes he has a detour and he'll say, he'll give you another way and just go around the enemy. But sometimes he calls you to walk straight to the face of the enemy and go straight through. Him. And sometimes that's, that's not an alternative. And so you have to know that when God says walk straight through, you got to walk straight through. But if God gives you a detour, if God gets you, gives you another way, take it. But he's not going to always give you that other way. Because God's all about development. God's all about preparing his people for next. And he said, if you don't fight this battle or you don't deal with this, you won't be ready for the next one. Every place I went in my life, it always it always prepared me for next. My, my, my current day battles wasn't about today. It was about my tomorrow. It was about what I was going to face tomorrow. You know, in area, every area of your life, think about that. Everything you go through in your relationships is to prepare you for what he has for you tomorrow. Everything you go through in your career is to prepare you for the next job or the next career. Everything is to prepare you for next. Because God is always a moving God. God's an intentional God, a God full of purpose, a God full of uh, intentionality. And he knows what he's what he's called you to do. He knows where he needs you in a certain time. He has to get you to a place. So God is strategic and, and fulfilling his plan. That's all he's doing. The work that he began, he's completing it. He said, I'll complete it. And that's a promise. So God's going to fulfill his promise. Well, are you going to fulfill yours? And that's the question. So don't respond in fear. That's the next thing. When the odds are against you, don't respond in fear. You know, don't respond to your fears. And when I say respond, I'm talking about how you re how you react. I'm not talking about never feeling scared. I'm not talking about never feeling small, never feeling like you're you're not enough. Everybody's gonna go through those emotions, but don't respond to them. Don't don't act off of those things. You gotta respond like the God that's on the inside of you. That's gonna give you the confidence. That's gonna give you the wisdom and the power to keep moving forward and accomplish what God has called you to do. Number five, history can repeat itself. You got to know if God did it before, He'll do it again. And if 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 He if He paid the bill last year, He'll pay the bill this year. If He healed your body last year, He'll heal your body this year. You got to know if God did it. These the blessings of God is not a one day thing. God's, God's blessing is overflowing. God's blessings are available. If your car insurance, as long as you pay your, your car insurance, it's always available if you have a wreck. If your car insurance is, just, is that available, how much more shall God be available? And God's like, every day of the, of the week and of the year, your, your premium is paid up. And it's enough. And, 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 and if I did it before, I'll do it again. History can't. Don't think you're walking in luck. What what did Jonathan McRoe's old song? I'm not lucky. I'm loved. This is not. You, we, sometimes Christians we think we just had got good luck, or we just uh, it just happened to work out for me. No, no. God's favor is on your life, and and God wants to bless you, and God is going to bless you, and 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 history can repeat itself. If you can't say, oh, it's a one time thing. No, if he did it before, he'll do it again. Let me read this. 1 Samuel 17, 34. It says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it arose against me, I called, I caught it by his beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has not defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said, David, go and the Lord shall be with you. And so you got to have that type of faith knowing if God did it before, he'll do it again. If he, if he caused me to kill the bear once, I'll kill the bear again. If the bear had the nerves to show up, 
you know, you gotta let the bear know that the same thing that happened to you before go happen to you again. It's not me being arrogant, but it's in me knowing that greater is he that's in me, that he that's in the world, knowing that 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 God can do anything but fail and that God is with me. I don't know everything, but I know that God is with me. I know that he's with me enough to know that the bear ain't gonna kill me, that the lion ain't gonna kill me. I've killed them before. I've defeated you before. And so I, otherwise, David said, I'm used to the odds being against me. I'm used to people saying I can't do it. I'm used to people saying, saying that'll never be done. You know, at one point they said Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scoring record would never be broken. But LeBron, LeBron kept playing and kept playing and kept playing and kept playing and kept scoring and kept winning and kept doing and kept doing what he was doing. And one day he shot that one jumper and he broke the record. So there's nothing that can't be done and that what will be done. Don't think that, that you're the only one that's going to do do something or or that it's, if it's done once, it'll never be done again. There's always going to be somebody greater coming after you. There's always going to be something. And God, God, history will repeat itself. And God will recruit. He will repeat itself. Uh, history will repeat itself through your life, not just through different people. But God is just saying, what I did for you before, the wisdom that I gave you before, I'll do it again. So history can't repeat itself. That bear you killed two years ago, the bear that comes tomorrow, you'll kill that bear. Whatever comes up against you, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. The same victory God has given you in the past. You know, that, there's a song that says, we got history. It talks about the same being God got history. And if he, he did these things in the past, he'll do them now. He's the same God yesterday, today and forevermore. All right, I'm, I'm done. I'm on my last point. Number six, what you have is enough to win. Like I say, you you worried about you don't have this, you don't have that, that you're missing. I talked about that early. You worry about what's not on your plate, that you're not enjoying what's on your plate. You know, uh, enjoy the food and the things that God has given you now and stop complaining about what you don't have because what you have is enough to win. First Samuel 17, starting at verse 30, he says, So soul clothed David, clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these, for I have not tested them. And so when you try to do things like another man or you try to put on the same armor, the things that people that have been successful and try to do the same thing the same way with the same garments, it don't always work. David said, I can't, I can't do this. I can't fight Goliath in your armor, in these clothes that you have given me, in these systems that you use. You know, I got to take the system that God has given me, the, the wisdom that God has given me. You know, the devil from 1987 is a different devil in, in 2023. I can't, you know, I can't look back on the successful uh, people that, that defeated certain things and did certain things and think I'm going to do it the same way. It's like, I, that, that garment don't fit me now. If I try to use a 1987 uh, garment or, or system or thing, uh, weapon to fight a 2023 devil, I'm going to be defeated real quickly. And so we got to understand, we got to use what God has given us in this day, in this hour. Because not only is it is it made to fit us and made you, it's, gonna be, it's not going to be outdated. And oftentimes uh, what, what, what makes you What's important to update your computer and, and, and do the upgrades is because a lot of a lot of your programs, a lot of things on that computer may not work properly without the upgrades. Because the system has been upgraded, you have to you have to make sure that you upgrade your computer and that everything is compatible with each other, that it can communicate with each other, that it can work properly when you need it. And so in your life, you got to make sure you're important that you do the upgrades, that, that you stay in the presence of the Lord and know that there's an upgrade. What, what happens when your computer needs to upgrade? Your computer has a pop up and it'll say, uh, we need to do these upgrades. And you can actually schedule it to say, when there's an upgrade, do it in the middle of the night while I'm not using my computer. But all in all, you got to do your upgrade in order sometimes for some of these programs to work. And so whatever you use, make sure it's, it's, it's usually something you already have in the house. 
and you are, and, and, and don't try to fight with another man's. Don't try to, people tell you, you need to do it like this because so-and-so did it. No, it's like, this is what God has told me. I'm going to utilize the weapons that he's given me. Even when they don't look as cute as somebody else's. But I'm going to do it God's way because God's way is effective. All right. And then they said, those, those garments weren't tested. He said, I cannot walk with these. For I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he started to staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And, you know, he took the shepherd's bag. And he took his five rocks. David said, I'll just use these five rocks. How absurd and crazy is look. You're about to fight a giant and you come up there with some rocks. Some stones to throw at him. That's like being in a fight where people got military weapons and you sit there, you, you got a, a handgun. You know, what kind of fight is that? It may look crazy, but when God anoints you, it doesn't matter what weapons you have compared to somebody else's weapons. Your weapons are going to come out uh, uh, going to be more effective because you have God behind it. So what you have is enough to win. Stop complaining about what you don't have. When the odds are against you, it's not about the odds with God. It's about your obedience. And so when you take what God is giving you and you take it and you do what God says do with it, God said, I'll bless it because of your obedience. It doesn't matter what odds are against you. It doesn't matter what the other people are doing, what they're doing. See, good teams and good and good organizations don't they, they they play a sport based upon they make other people adapt to their climate. They make other people adapt to their environment versus them coming in and have to play like the other team wants them to play. You know, you take the Antonio and you take the uh, San Antonio Spurs doing their dynasty. You take Golden State, the Bulls, all those teams that had dynasties in their sport. I'm using basketball now, but as they had dynasties, when they played. Other teams had to conform to what they were doing versus them conforming to what the other team was doing so much because they were a dynasty. They they knew what they had and they used what they had in the house to perfection. And that's what that's what builds a dynasty. That's what builds a winning team. When you take what you have and you utilize every piece the way that God has told you to utilize it, that's what brings victory. It doesn't mean always who has the most talent. It doesn't mean always who has this and who has that. When God's behind you, when no no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper you, you know, and greater is he that's in you, as I keep saying. But what you have is enough to win. And you gotta know that. That you can win as long as God, as long as you do it God, if you do it God's way and God has validated your plan and your strategy, you don't have nothing to be afraid of. You don't have nothing to be worried about. And the odds may be against you. But guess what? If God be for you, who can be against you? Who can stand against you? Who, who, you know, who's, you know, who's gonna overcome you? You can't lose because the God that we serve is behind your plan. It doesn't mean God. It's simply through your obedience. It doesn't mean He loves you more than somebody else. God loves us all. There's no favoritism, but God will attach Himself to to our, our obedience. He will attach himself to, to our confidence in him. And he'll say, I'll defend you. I'll, I'll, I'll make you not look like a fool. And even when you look like a fool to others, I'll, I'll make the foolish, the wisdom of this world look like foolishness because I'm that smart. Their ways are not my ways. Their thoughts are not my thoughts. And I'm going to make the whole world look stupid. Not because not I just want to make people look stupid, but when my wisdom is manifested, it makes the smartest people look dumb. Because that's how smart I am. Because I am the all-wise God. So when the odds are against you, all I'm trying to get to you tonight is to know that, excuse me, there's a God inside of you that's greater. And you don't have to be afraid. You're not in this by yourself. God is with you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? That's all I'm trying to get you to know. You're going to win this thing. It doesn't matter about your own. It's not about your own endurance and your own strength. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. If you submit to God's spirit, if you submit to his plan, you'll do exploits and you'll do things that you never thought you could do. You'll defeat things that you never thought you would defeat. And those things that, that look so big will begin to look like little grasshoppers because your God will be so enlarged in your eyes. 
and the God that you serve, he'll be so big in your life. He'll manifest himself in a way that you've never seen him before. God bless you guys. I'm done tonight. And I hope you got something out of that. The odds may be against you, but if God be for you, who can be against you? You're going to win in this season. God has favored you in this season. You're going to win. Everything attached to you will win simply because God is for you and God is with you. And he's attached to your obedience. Have a blessed night, all right? Uh, see you next time.